Welcome back. A landmark silicosis settlement of 5 billion runs was recently granted in the Johannesburg High Court. But there are a few questions that we would like to probe here. How will the settlement improve the lives of those affected by the occupational lung diseases, tuberculosis and silicosis? And uh, is progress being made in preventing the disease? To answer just that, I have in the studio with me Abre van Thieren, who is executive representing the Occupational Lung Disease Working Group. He's an executive with Harmony Gold. And from our Cape Town studios, Charles Abrams, who is director at Abrams Kivitz Incorporated, representing some of the claimants. Now, Abre, welcome to the show, and thanks very much for being with us here. I would like you to just give me a sense of the history of how this matter was initiated, at least from the industry side. Thanks very much. Um, uh, back in about 2013, six of the mining companies came, to, came together um, and they agreed um, to form occupation, the Occupational Lung Disease Working Group to come up with a comprehensive and sustainable solution for, for um, silicosis and TB or occupational lung disease in South Africa. Um, that mandate uh, was based on three pillars. The first was obviously to try and settle the litigation. The, sec the second one was to improve the operations of the Medical Bureau for Occupational Diseases and the Compensation Commissioner for Occupational Diseases. And then the third leg is to fix the problem for the future, and that means a change in legislation. Um, now we can tick one box and that's the settlement agreement um, and we've had very good progress on, on assisting the, medical, the occupational um, uh, commissioner um, and we've had good progress with uh, uh, consensus around the change in legislation but um, the one that is completed or almost completed is the settlement. All right, now, Charles Abrams, let me bring you in on the conversation. Let's trace the four-year settlement. It took four years to arrive at this settlement. But how did you identify the claimants and how did you put the whole matter together, I mean, the engagement together uh, with the industry? Um, the, you know, the history um, is you know, somewhat longer than uh, where the industry you know, started. Uh, this litigation goes back to the early 2000s uh, in the aftermath of the asbestos litigation which culminated in a successful settlement and that resulted you know, in the establishment of as the Asbestos Relief Trust as well as the Khalakali Trust. And those were in respect of miners who had you know, contracted you know, asbestosis. We then identified you know, the next uh, you know, big you know, issue in mining being that of miners with silicosis and tuberculosis. It is a historic uh, legacy you know, issue which we felt you know, has not sufficiently been addressed uh, post-1994. Uh, the way in which we then proceeded to do was to undertake a test you know, litigation and the purpose of the test litigation was to ascertain whether a miner who has contracted an occupational lung disease could directly sue uh, the mining companies for the disease so contracted. That litigation uh, started in 2006 and finally got resolved at the Constitutional Court in 2011 when the Constitutional Court overturned the judgments of the previous court that essentially held that a, mining comp that a miner could not, but the Constitutional Court overturned that and ultimately gave the green light to miners, uh, you know, stating that they do have a right to sue the mining companies. Well, Charles, that what judgment? Yeah, so, so let me let me let me let me come in here and, and find out something from you that you yeah. know the, for the symptoms of these diseases to be developed will take a, a long time, isn't it? Because some of the 
uh, mine workers or the beneficiaries or claimants in this matter would have worked on the mines in the 60s and 70s. So how were they identified then as the right group of people to pursue this matter before the courts? You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the diseases that we are talking about, silicosis and uh, tuberculosis themselves have, you know, a latency periods that can take, you know, up to 10 years and more. In the case of uh, tuberculosis, might be a little bit, you know, earlier. Notwithstanding, um, the, what we, you know, felt was that in 1965, there was a decisive changes, you know, to the legislation. Um, and we felt that that was a very, you know, useful, you know, starting point to develop what we call the class, you know, period, you know, of miners having worked from 1965, you know, until to date. So that means to say that miners with exposure and who ultimately developed, you know, silicosis or who is still likely to develop silicosis in the next 12 years and the same with miners who had contracted tuberculosis those miners would certainly, you know, be the kind of people having worked underground to fall within the ambit of, you know, this class action. Now, we're talking about uh, the miners who have succumbed to tuberculosis or contracted tuberculosis and silicosis. Some of them may have died along the way as a result of these diseases. Are they going to be accommodated in this uh, settlement? Yeah, uh, Tim, certainly where there are evidence to that effect, um, some kind of medical record, the beneficiaries or their dependents will receive compensation in line with the trust deed, um, and provided they, they actually worked on one of the qualifying mines for, a, you know, for the uh, a qualifying period. How, how many mines are we talking, mining companies are we talking about? Because not all of them. Are represented yeah in so, this so, settlement. so overall the six big companies involved in this is um, Anglo-American South Africa, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Goldfields, uh, Harmony, Sabanya, African Rainbow Minerals, um, I hope I haven't left uh, out anyone, um, it's six companies and they owned or had um, operated some of uh, some 37 or 38 qualifying mines. I, I'm not sure of the exact number of mines on the settlement agreement, but, but um, all of those <coughs> companies are parties to the but, agreement. But there are but other companies that are not part of the settlement. Yeah, there's some companies that decided not to participate in this process. And what does that mean then? What is the implication of that, uh, Charles? Uh, the fact that some companies are not part of this settlement. <laughs> So the settlement is, you know, very useful now that we have, you know, nearly brought it to a conclusion. Um, we have all the, in, you know, intent of pursuing the claims against the non-settling companies. Um, you will recall that the matter has been taken up, you know, on appeal. The settling companies will no longer be part of that appeal. So only those companies that, you know, remain the non-settling companies uh, one such company is DRD Gold and the other, is, the other one is ERPM. Um, we will pursue the matter. However, we do think that now that we have a settlement, that we would encourage you know, the, you know, those companies, uh, including Rand Gold and Exploration and Pan African Resources, to seriously consider um, settling so that there could be closure you know, on this matter and moving forward. But if not, then we will pursue the action against them. Now, there are 10 classes in this lawsuit in terms of the claimants, right? Uh, you, you have um, uh, disaggregated the, the claimants or, or categorized them into 10 classes. Can you expand a bit more of what you mean by this 10 classes? Very briefly, I say very simplistically, so we, there are two broad classes. So there's so one, the broad silicosis class and a broad tuberculosis class. And within them, you have those who are alive and those who are <coughs> dependents in both classes. Once you understand that, then you can then go into the various subclasses in each of the silicosis and tuberculosis class. So say for instance, a miner who has uh, silicosis, you have what we call a lung function impairment of less than 10%. 
such a miner would receive 70,000 rands. Then we have a miner with a lung function impairment of 10% to 40. That miner will receive 150,000. And the miner with 40% and more lung function impairment silicosis, he, will, he or she will receive 250,000 rands. And that's essentially the structure of it. There are exceptional categories, and the highest um, you know, bracket or category is you know, 500,000 for those you know, with acute conditions you know, of silicosis. Tuberculosis follow its own structure you know, very much in a similar you know, you know, fashion. Right, uh, Abri, you can expand a bit more on this. I mean, how do you identify uh, the, the particular claimants as well as assess their conditions so that you can uh, correctly or appropriately compensate them, uh, given the, the classes that Charles has just explained? So, so obviously, the biggest challenge in this whole exercise is not our current employees, it's those ex-miners. And those ex-miners come from um, the rural areas in South Africa and the neighboring countries. Lesotho, most probably the biggest, uh, Mozambique, the second biggest, Swaziland, uh, some in Botswana, uh, and maybe even a few in, in Zimbabwe. Now, fortunately, um, you know, because the, the history dates back to 1965, um, through collaboration, and this, you know, this is actually the magical story about this whole thing, is it's a story about collaboration. We've been able to um, establish a database um, with uh, the compensation commissioner, and then on the one hand, to use his data, um, the industry paid for him to, uh, to digitize it, um, and then with TEBA, the Employment Bureau of Africa, that's been a labor broker technically in the history of the mining industry in South Africa, they've all got records of where people were recruited from. Now, we did various experiments, and there's quite a, um, a good correlation from where an employee was originally recruited to where you can go and f look for him today, mm. that recruit recruitment station. Now, that gives us an opportunity to map areas where there's obviously um, greater numbers of people. Um, and so, so we'll have to go targeting those areas. And then you need to, um, ex-employees will have to undergo a medical examination if they qualify, obviously, if they're one of the qualifying companies, ex-employees, and they were exposed to dust, they will undergo a benefit medical examination. Um, and if they then have one of these diseases, diseases um, they will be certified by a, um, a panel of doctors, um, and then the rest is actually just payment. And then they will be classed accordingly and then be right. awarded their compensation. Yeah. All right, we'll be looking at how this compensation is going to be used as well as uh, how mining safety is being improved. As we continue this conversation, my guest is Abre van Fieren, who is representing the Occupational Lung Disease Working Group of the mining industry, as well as Charles Abrams, uh, director at Abrams Kivitz who is representing some of the claimants. Be sure to engage with the show using the hashtag the Modisa Network on social media. We'll be with you in a moment.